Welcome to the class day ceremony celebrating the accomplishments of the general studies class of 2012. I am especially pleased that President Lee Bollinger, Provost John Coatsworth, Executive Vice President Nicholas Dirks, and General George Casey and Mrs. Casey are here to share in our celebration. I'd also like to welcome our class day speaker, T.R. Reardon, class of 2008. It is also my privilege to welcome our reunion classes and the reunion committee, co-chaired this year by Elaine Bernstein, who is celebrating her 40th year as a GS alumna, and George Hodge, class of 2007. And last but not least, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers joining us. <laughs> Sit down. The creation of GS 65 years ago represents a milestone in the evolution of undergraduate education at elite colleges. What makes GS unique is that we actively recruit students who have taken an untraditional path and mainstream them fully into a traditional and rigorous Ivy League academic program. The marriage in the classroom of traditional and untraditional students enhances the intellectual discourse in a very special way and makes the Columbia undergraduate experience unlike that at any other Ivy League university. The success of GS is due in large part to the commitment of the Columbia faculty to create true diversity in the undergraduate community. Among these talented GS undergraduates, you will find the largest number of veterans at any Ivy League university. <laughs> 41 of whom are graduating today. GS is also home to innovative dual BA programs, like the challenging joint program with Lisk College of the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is over half a century old. We are especially pleased that today, the first five students will be graduating from our newest dual BA program, with the Institut d'études politiques, known more commonly as Sciences Po, the premier French university specializing in the social sciences. <laughs> Whether GS students are dancers, entrepreneurs, or firefighters, Wall Street bankers, or tech wizards, whether they are working parents or professional models, whether they are international students or new Americans, they receive the same superb Columbia education as all Columbia undergraduates. Members of the class of 2012, you represent the cutting edge of undergraduate education, and you have proven yourselves through your academic accomplishments we are privileged to count you members of the Columbia intellectual and alumni communities. Since he assumed the presidency of Columbia in 2002, Lee Bollinger has articulated a dynamic vision for the future of this great university. In the past decade, President Bollinger has spearheaded Columbia's ambitious expansion into Manhattanville in West Harlem, where the first stages of construction are well underway. He continues to enhance scientific research, exemplified by the New Science Building and the Center for Neuroscience, currently under construction. He has also moved Columbia into the forefront of international universities with the establishment of Columbia centers in numerous cities around the world. 
President Bollinger is also a committed educator, continuing to teach an undergraduate course on the First Amendment even while he leads Columbia. It is my privilege to introduce to you the 19th president of Columbia University, Lee C. Bollinger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. You, you know that they're predicting 50% chance of rain and thunderstorms tomorrow, <laughs> which um, I, I added the thunderstorms, they're actually not <laughs> predicting them. Which shows we're not quite as dumb as you might think. Um, thank you very much, Dean Ahn, and good morning and welcome to everyone standing in this spectacular place in front of Alma Mater herself. I too want to say happy Mother's Day and congratulations to Columbia University School of General Studies class of 2012. So let me begin by thanking Peter Ahn for his wonderful, wonderful leadership of this unique school. I know no one who is more nurturing than Peter. And I want to recognize all the members of the reunion classes who are present here, but most importantly, the alumni from the class of 1952 who are celebrating their 60th reunion. General studies is the reason that Columbia stands out among its peer universities for having so many talented, remarkable, and determined students with many other life stories and accomplishments. Your class valedictorian, Maxwell Bertolero, may present himself today as a scholar of philosophy and psychology, his double major, but his success in navigating the future will be influenced by his earlier determination to be a winning motocross racer. Catherine Minogue Natchison, the General Studies salutatorian, was an actress and member of a bluegrass band before arriving at the school and discovering her passion for classical art and architecture. Our class day speaker, Tom Reardon, is an inspiring example of this lifelong dedication to learning. He graduated from general studies with honors in 2008, yet before he ever enrolled in a class at Columbia, he already had been the principal architect of a major technological innovation, Internet Explorer. And still, Tom counts his four years at General Studies as the most intellectually important of his life. Led by a contingent of military veterans receiving a degree from General Studies, this year we are celebrating the largest number of veterans to graduate from Columbia since the era of the post-World War II GI Bill. <clears throat> And so I want to recognize retired U.S. Army General George W. Casey and thank him and his wife, Sheila, for being with us here this morning. General Casey served as commanding general in Iraq from 2004 to 2007, and his presence here today is a fitting tribute to our graduating veterans. Because, because I have the privilege of addressing you, and all the other graduates of the class of 2012 at the commencement ceremony on Wednesday, I'm going to speak just briefly today. But I do want to say three important things. The first is to recognize general studies for its long and proud tradition in the history of Columbia. The school represents the ideal we strive for throughout the institution. Academic excellence, social opportunity, and a burning desire to learn. But no part succeeds at this in the same way as general studies. Whenever we hear the backgrounds and then the achievements of general studies students, we all feel inspired 
and have a sense that this is what it's really all about. The second point is that you, the class of 2012, add to this distinction of general studies and Columbia. I know many of you through my own class on the First Amendment and through other contexts, and I've heard about many more of you. Not least in that last category is right now the most famous Colombian in the nation, a classics major immigrant who fled a war-torn former Yugoslavia and resident of Bronx who works here at Lerner Hall and has diligently pursued his undergraduate degree for 12 years, Gats Filippi. So many of you have your own personal stories from the battlefield to the ballet stage and so many kinds of life experiences. But collectively, you all bring us closer to that ideal we strive for. And the third and final point is to urge you, as all members of the Columbia community, to serve the nation and the world with the extraordinary talents you possess and have developed here. The world is in desperate need of your help in so many ways. And I hope you will leave here with a sense of responsibility to others as well as pride in yourselves and this latest of your many accomplishments. Congratulations, and I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, President Bollinger. I am pleased to introduce our distinguished guest, retired General George W. Casey, who served as the 36th U.S. Army Chief of Staff from 2007 until 2011, and the Commanding General of the Multinational Force in Iraq from 2004 to 2007. General Casey graduated from Georgetown University and its ROTC program in 1970, beginning a distinguished military career spanning four decades. He earned his master's degree in international relations from the University of Denver. In April of 2011, General Casey retired from the Army and has devoted a significant portion of his time to helping returning veterans reintegrate successfully into civilian life. He is especially passionate about promoting educational opportunities for veterans. It is a privilege to introduce to you General George W. Casey. Thank you very much. Good morning. I know some of you are probably asking yourselves what the general is doing at the general studies class day. It seemed to work for me, but my wife told me it's not about you. Uh, President Bollinger, uh, Dean on faculty and alumni, uh, families of the graduating class and particularly all of the mothers of the graduating students that are out there today and the class of 2012. I'm here this morning to help recognize exceptional accomplishment. Exceptional accomplishment by Columbia University, by the class of 2012, and by the members of this class who are receiving their diplomas after serving their country in some of the toughest combat environments that our armed forces have known. A few months ago, I spoke at the business school here on leadership, and I asked how many veterans in the audience, how many veterans were in the audience. I was surprised when about a third of the audience raised their hand. Almost all of them had had recent service in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it became clear to me that there was a focused effort going on here at Columbia to attract veterans. So I asked around and I found that Columbia University and the School of General Studies in particular were working very hard to provide this generation of veterans an opportunity for world-class education. Close to 500 veterans from every branch of the service are enrolled in this year's graduate and undergraduate programs at Columbia, and almost 90 
will receive their diplomas in the coming days. Yes, you can. <laughs> About half of those graduates will come from the School of General Studies. And as you know, as Peter mentioned, the School of General Studies was founded in 1947, at least in part to meet the educational needs of the generation coming out of World War II. True to its history, over 200 veterans are currently enrolled in the School of General Studies. 41 of those veterans will graduate today. As President Bollinger said, that is the largest population of gradu graduating veterans from this school since World War II. So President Bollinger and, and Dean Ahn, congratulations on setting the standard for the Ivy League. Love that. Now if I might, just a, a few words about the graduating veterans. It, it may not seem like it every day, but our country has been at war for over a decade since we were attacked not far from here on September 11th. 2001. Since that time, over 2 million men and women have deployed in harm's way to ensure that that never happens again. This service has not come without a cost. Over 6,000 servicemen and women have lost their lives, leaving some 20,000 surviving family members. Over 40,000 men and women have been wounded in action, and almost 8,000 of them seriously enough to require long-term care. The cumulative effects of this war will be with us for some time. And as a country, we can never forget the obligation that President Abraham Lincoln so eloquently conveyed to us to care for those who have borne the burden. Part of that obligation is to provide the opportunity to veterans to contribute productively to our society after they have left the service of their country. And that's what we celebrate here today. Having led a number of our veterans in Iraq and observed others in Afghanistan, I can tell you that these men and women have performed brilliantly in some of the most demanding environments imaginable. They've lost comrades, they've endured untold hardships, and been injured themselves. And yet, they have remained committed to the values and ideals that make this country what it is today, the greatest country on earth. I'd like, to, I'd like to ask those 41 veterans who are distinguished by the red, right, white, and blue cords to rise, please. You 41 represent and epitomize what is best about America, and I salute you today for your accomplishments. Finally, to all of you graduates today, I must say that as I read your biographies, I, I was awed by your commitment to education and by what you have already accomplished. You have proven that not only are you not traditional, but that you are extraordinary. And I can tell you that in this unstable, complex, and complicated world that we live in, our country, indeed our world, is in need of extraordinary leaders to guide us through the coming decades. And you are well on your way to becoming those leaders. So congratulations to you all, and I wish you every success as you take what you've learned here and make a difference in our world. Good luck. Thank you. Thomas Reardon III grew up in a working-class Irish family in New England. His entrepreneurial spirit trumped going to college out of high school, and he soon found himself at Microsoft, where he spent nine creative years. At 24 years old, while working on Windows 95, Reardon conceptualized Internet Explorer, creating the project and acting as architect through its worldwide adoption in the late 1990s. 
He's recognized as the principal visionary of Microsoft's adoption of internet and web technologies and its move from proprietary technologies towards open standards. Reardon holds six US patents, was a founding board member to the World Wide Web Consortium, where he was instrumental in the development of several critical languages. He went on to serve as OpenWave's chief technology officer, where he led development of the first mobile device web browsers. In 2004, Reardon took what he thought would be only a six-month sabbatical to expand his intellectual horizons. Those six months have now stretched to eight years. He completed his BA with honors in classics here at Columbia and a master's from Duke in neuroscience. Reardon is currently pursuing his doctorate at Columbia in neurobiology under the tutelage of one of the luminaries of the field, Professor Thomas Jessel. I am very proud to introduce to you the 2012 Class Day speaker and 2008 GS graduate, T.R. Reardon. Hello, owls. Dean on, President Bollinger, General and Mrs. Casey. Uh, I'm not sure what I actually learned in my first four years at Columbia, but I did confirm this. It was plurimum enum refert, vitam aliquis extendat an mortem. It's a Seneca, my, my favorite Roman philosopher. And what it says is, what matters most is not, excuse me, what matters most is whether one is extending one's life or merely delaying one's death. Now, when, you, when you're asked to do one of these speeches, you feel a lot of pressure to try to create a linear narrative about how uh, your life played out or how the, uh, the ideas that you pursued played out and how A led to B. And, and it sort of strikes me that rich lives lived well are actually quite non-linear. Uh, I, I look to, I heard it when I was walking up earlier, Bob Dylan plugging in his his guitar into an amplifier for the first time and leaving folk music behind, or, or Steve Jobs deposed from Apple, starting Pixar and reinventing the world of animation, or even Bill Gates leaving his pet project, leaving Microsoft, and turning his all of his efforts towards philanthropy and trying to reinvent philanthropy not just with money but with IQ. My own uh, reinvention, my radical left turns, led me here to Columbia in 2004. I should give you a little bit more of a bio uh, uh, to set up that left turn. So I was born uh, in New England. I'm one of 18 children. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> uh, but it, it's actually what led to my first real reinvention in my life. And that was actually that I was at the tail end of 10 natural children. And when I was 11 years old, uh, my parents decided to adopt a family of eight children that were all just younger than me. And uh, I had spent that part of my life as the younger brother to a bunch of tyrants. And uh, I was able to, in a single weekend, go from being the baby of the family to being the big brother. And it was actually the first real transformative experience of my life. Uh, we were taught back then to respect education, but it wasn't necessarily an end goal. Going to college wasn't a goal in and of itself. In my family, there were really just two lessons. Number one was, eat the food that's put in front of you. And number two was, get a job. Uh, I graduated high school fairly early. I graduated at 15, and uh, I took that to heart. In New Hampshire, you needed to be 16 to work, so I did the most logical thing. I forged my birth certificate. Now, it's, it's one thing to pretend to be 16 when you're 15. It's a whole other thing to pretend to be an 18-year-old college freshman. I was a disaster at school that fall. And uh, while I was busy failing out of school, I actually started to uh, engage more deeply with uh, what had been my passion all those years, 
uh, which was the development of software. I had actually fallen in when I was 10 years old with a group of hackers in, out of the MIT hacking scene. This wasn't the kind of hacking you're thinking about, about breaking into networks or taking down uh, websites. This was uh, a different kind of hacking of kids that were challenging each other with games and mental, uh, excuse me, little computer puzzles. And that kind of investment of my time led to a series of jobs and ultimately to a startup I did when I was 17. And that startup led me out to the West Coast and by a couple of hiccups into Microsoft in 1990. Now back then, in 1990, it was the pre-IPO era. Uh, the pre-buzz era. You didn't go out to the West Coast to go make a fortune. You went out there to go work on interesting problems, to go work with the best people on hard problems. And I got to go to Microsoft in 1990, well before Windows had exploded, and, and work on very early versions of it with absolutely the best computer scientists and the best thinkers about software in the world. During that, I, I started work on a project called Windows 93. You will know it as Windows 95. We were not good at predicting when things would ship. Uh, and uh, towards the end of that project, it was actually something that was kind of a kick in the gut to me. I was actually asked to give up my management role on it. I have to admit, at 22 years old, I was not the world's most effective manager. Uh, so I actually had to give up my group, and I walked away from that, and uh, was asked to be an architect on the next version of Windows. I wasn't happy about this, but just luckily enough, a week later, I was in Seattle, I was talking with a friend who ran a music label, and he talked to me about this thing called Mosaic he had just seen. This is pretty early, and he showed me a demo of it that he had seen on, uh, on a very early version of the web, and I saw uh, uh, the things that were behind that, and I got to meet Tim Berners-Lee and see his vision for the original web and this idea of a worldwide information network that might allow scientists to collaborate in real time, and it was breathtaking to me. And I was able to take that idea back into Microsoft. I'll emphasize, that idea came from a person in the music industry, not another computer scientist, but a random interaction. And I brought that back in, and that became Internet Explorer. Now, I don't want to advise always following every last curiosity to a reinvention. Uh, I, I sort of advise following them one at a time and jumping in deep into each of them. Uh, we had this expression at Microsoft, a, a term of aspersion. We called it cookie licking. Cookie licking was, uh, you can imagine you're in a, in a room in an office meeting, and people come in, and somebody brings in a snack for everyone, like a tray of cookies. And there's probably four chocolate chip cookies and a couple of peanut butter cookies here, some sugar cookies over here. And people start doing a quick calculation, and they start to realize there's probably not enough cookies or not enough of their favorite cookies. So somebody will reach over, and they'll just pick up all the chocolate chip cookies, one, one after another, and lick them, and put them right back on the plate in front of everyone, thereby declaring ownership over those cookies. Now, it's obviously a metaphor for sort of a collaboration failure, that uh, what, what happens in these meetings, you're doing group design work and you're trying to decide who's going to do what part of a project, and the really curious and aggressive people, they just want to take every last cool part of the project, and they'll say, oh no, I'll do that part, and I'll get that part, I'll do the web browser, I'll do email, I'll do the user interface, and then at the end, they've sort of licked every single cookie there. It, it doesn't go anywhere. It's just spinning your wheels. Uh, at the end of the time I, I spent at Microsoft, we, uh, the core Internet Explorer team and I left and started a new company to go work on mobile web technologies to have this idea that the web would follow you around rather than you go to the web. And uh, it actually didn't work. We were way early. It really took until 2007 with the launch of the iPhone that there really was a ubiquitous mobile web experience. What I'm trying to emphasize there is that it's not every curiosity and every invention what looked like a surefire success for us that will actually lead to the reward you think it will. But it did lead me somewhere else. It led me in 2004 to lunch with Freeman Dyson. I was on my sabbatical and uh, I was out at a Silicon Valley technical conference and I got seated by no planning of my own next to Freeman Dyson. Freeman, if you don't know Freeman, shame on you. Freeman is one of the great minds of the 20th century. He is first and foremost a physicist, uh, a legendary physicist. He's written extensively about religion, philosophy, natural philosophy. He is one of the great minds of the 20th century. Uh, and he was there, and I get to not know what to talk to. I started talking to him about the weather. And when you talk to Freeman about the weather, you don't just say whether or not it's going to be rainy or sunny, you talk about meteorology and the early invention of computing and how that led to the launching of the first satellites, and he just has so much in his head that he's thought and woven together, and it, it just always blows me away. And at one point I told him, you know, I'm doing this sabbatical and I'm, I'm thinking I'd like to brush up on some high school Latin, that's how I'll spend my time, and, and he reached and he grabbed my arm and he said, oh yes, you must. 
He said, read Tacitus, Agricola. I thought, Agricola, the farmer, yeah, okay. I got and I thought, Freeman, why Tacitus? Why Tacitus for something else? And he said, well, I had been reading it uh, a year ago, just kind of reviewing it. I, was, I thought, Freeman Dyson, out of all of his accomplishments, in his spare time for fun is reading Tacitus, perhaps the most difficult Latin author. Maybe my idea to study classics wasn't so goofy after all. So I actually moved to New York and enrolled in GS and pursued this degree in classics. Now, it was three years into that, that right there in Butler Library, up on the sixth floor of the classics library, I was uh, surfing for some subjects to write a paper about. It wasn't assigned reading, but I was surfing and stumbled across Seneca and I stumbled across that line I used with you earlier. Uh, I'll remind you, it was, what matters most is whether one is extending her life or merely delaying her death. It was extendat, vitam ad mortem. Now, really, when you unpack the Latin there, and I only at that point in time, three years in, could read the Latin and not translate it. I read it as it existed on the page, and what was there wasn't what I said. It was actually something almost dark, but very potent. He was saying extendat to both vitam and mortem, whether one was extending one's life or extending death itself, as if you had already died and were just continuing the dying. Ah. I knew right then that I'd been vindicated in my decision to come to Columbia. So I always have a side curiosity, and, and at that point in time, I remember reading an article in New York Times about cells, uh, about cancer biology, and I, I was sort of curious, thinking, I don't know what a cell is. I don't really know what a cell is. It divides, and it, it is what we are, but I don't really know what a cell is. I don't know how it works, what, what it's made of. So I, I did something that some people in the audience will understand as a death wish. I signed up for introductory biology with Deborah Moshewitz. <laughs> And I indulged that curiosity through to the end of my classics career, taking more biology, biochemistry, then neuroscience. And I started doing towards the end of that degree thinking, they, they, they say that studying a liberal arts degree is to try to teach you how to think, perhaps when to think, when to step back and think critically. I thought, actually, I'm much more curious about how we think. What's the structure of thought? And that propelled me into neuroscience and pursuing graduate studies in it. I am now a graduate student. I'm not a particularly good graduate student. It's hard. Uh, my peer group is now inverted. Instead of me being the youngest in the room, I'm one of the oldest in the room. But it's that discomfort of not being in my comfort zone, of being challenged every day, that is a thrill. I don't have to get myself up and work myself up into a lather to get to the lab. I love being in the lab. I love, most importantly, working with the best young scientists on Earth. Columbia Neuroscience is extraordinary. It is without peer. I get to test my ideas every week with one of the great neuroscientists in the world, Tom Jessel. I just want to leave with one thing about the diploma that you guys are all getting. Uh, so I have mine. Uh, hung up on a wall uh, in my home office, right, right next to my office, right next to my desk. And uh, every time my partner, Zan, comes in, she, she sees it there, it's next to a painting, and she sort of laughs and snorts and, and thinks it's kind of cheesy that I've like hung my thing on a wall like we're in a doctor's office. And, and you know, actually, it's not really like me. I don't get attached to objects. And, and frankly, I don't think degrees are worth much of anything. I do think the learning is valuable, but the degree, meh. I have this weird attachment to that piece of paper. I'm proud of that piece of paper. Congratulations on getting yours. Thanks. That was good. That was great. Thank you, Reardon. That was really quite wonderful. Eliza Catherine Minogue Notchison was born in Philadelphia and spent her early career as an actor and musician. She toured with a number of companies, but was most influenced by her work with the Ensemble Theatre Company Aquila, 
which is based in the classics department of NYU. Little did she know that after working with bluegrass musicians, singing with Sheriff Bob, studying acting, and working in theater and film in New York, she would find herself at Columbia studying the classical world she fell in love with working with Aquila. Catherine focuses on art and architecture within the ritual, myth, and political landscape of late archaic and classical Greeks and of Rome's early imperial period. Her senior thesis, The Temple of Hephaestus in Athens, an architectural and visual exercise in identity construction, won the Senior Thesis Prize in the Department of Art History and Archaeology. I'm happy to say that Catherine has decided to stay here at Columbia for her PhD. She graduates with startlingly high grades, honors in art history, summa cum laude, phi beta kappa, and as a member of the GS Honor Society. It is a privilege for me to introduce to you the salutatorian of the class of 2012, Catherine Minogue Notchison. President Bollinger, Provost Coatsworth, Executive Vice President Dirks, General Casey, Dean Ahn, fellow graduates, families, and friends. I'm gonna make this short and sweet because we all have some serious celebrating to do. Not to mention catching up with friends and family we've hardly seen since we began our Columbia adventures. These are the people who have supported us through it all through the decision years ago not to go to college, but to follow a dream or to do things our own way. They were there for us at every twist and turn. Then we came here, and I'm sure that at times, Columbia was as difficult for our friends and families as it was for us. My mom would call and casually ask a question like, what classes are you taking? And I would respond with a monologue about all the work we had to do, our professors, core requirements, the details of some ridiculously obscure topic, and what I might do with the rest of my life, assuming I ever made it through finals, and then say, oh, got to go to class, bye. <laughs> Those were fun chats, right? <laughs> How amazing is it that after years of this, and of weekends spent buried in books, holidays spent writing papers, after countless missed phone calls and birthdays, we still have friends and family. <laughs> and they've come all the way here, a day early and on Mother's Day, no less, to celebrate what we've accomplished. Truly, it was a joint effort. We could not have done it without you. We are really lucky to have you in our lives. Thank you for being there and for being here today, in person or in spirit. You know, it's funny. I haven't seen my family very much, and yet I haven't seen you guys very much either. <laughs> in many ways, for me, it's been a solitary four years. I've spent hours and days surrounded by books, but never have I been lonely. Our world has been defined by the campus gates, but walk into Butler Stacks and you'll see how vast our little world can be. It's magical. Spending Saturday nights in Butler might sound lonely, but you were there too. And even if we didn't talk, we knew we were in it together, pushing ourselves, struggling to find the right words or to understand that thing that just didn't make sense, and falling in love with the whole process. I came to Columbia after nearly a decade spent following a dream. I toured with a theater company, studied acting in New York, scored a commercial agent, was auditioning for roles in film and TV, supporting myself by working on blockbuster films and hit TV shows, and had worked with some of the most phenomenal people in the industry. 
Then during the writer's strike in 2008, I had some time off and decided to apply to Columbia. Sure, why not? <laughs> what else was I going to do with a week off? And a few months later, I was on set working as a stand-in for the Woody Allen film, Whatever Works, when I got a call from GS. I was accepted. When I started here, I thought I would go back to the film world, and if the academic job market in the humanities stays the way it is, I might be back on movie sets after I finish my PhD. But I'm on a new path now. There's a concept that one of my professors introduced me to quite by accident. This is the concept of the next future. The German word nexte means both near and next in English. So when German speakers try to say in the near future, it sometimes comes out as in the next future. And I can't think of a better way to describe my time here in the context of my life so far. We've had experiences here that we never imagined we'd have, including this very day, graduating from Columbia. I never thought I'd go to Athens to do research or spend the most monumental spring break on a class field trip to Rome or apply to PhD programs. But this was my next future. Everywhere I've turned for the past four years, I've found something new. New ideas, forms of expression, works of art, even entire disciplines I didn't know existed. As GS students, each one of us has a unique story, but what we've shared here is the experience of Columbia as a next future. But it wasn't all just a walk in the park. Our professors deliberately made this journey incredibly difficult. Without them, we probably would have slept eight hours a night, used Wikipedia all the time, and gone to the gym every day. But we'd all have written a bunch of worthless papers. Professors insist that students earn their achievements on their own. But without our professors, we would have no idea what we're capable of. And this is a really important lesson. Professors, we will be forever grateful to you for your dedication, your passion, and your integrity, for being our role models, and for making our lives miserable. The knowledge we've gained here will generate a lifetime of curiosity wherever our futures take us. There's a childlike wonder that comes from living in this magical place where new paths constantly appear before us, where our thoughts take shape on paper, where we're challenged beyond our limits and manage to survive every time. This gives us the ability to ask questions, to see from perspectives beyond our space and time, and to embrace not knowing as an opportunity to learn and grow. Looking back, Coming to Columbia took a great deal of courage. Looking forward, our futures will demand much more. I'd like to end with a poem by Shel Silverstein called This Bridge. This bridge will only take you halfway there to those mysterious lands you long to see through gypsy camps and swirling Arab fairs and moonlit woods where unicorns run free. So come and walk a while with me and share the twisting trails and wondrous worlds I've known. But this bridge will only take you halfway there, the last few steps you have to take alone. Thank you. Each year, the alumni key is awarded to a senior who has achieved distinction both academically and through service to the school and the undergraduate community. 
We are fortunate to have two wonderful recipients of the Alumni Key Award this year. Elaine Bernstein, GS72, and co-chair of the Alumni Reunion Committee will present the award. Our first recipient is Orly Ratsabi Cohen. Orly was born in Israel, and by the time she was 12, she played the flute, had written short stories, and taken ballet and karate classes. Because of her stellar academic record, she was selected as part of a delegation of high school students who toured the U.S. promoting a better understanding of Israel. She fell in love with New York and vowed to return which she did after completing her military service. She also met her husband in New York, so she is here to stay. At GS, Orly has been passionately engaged in student life, serving as an orientation leader numerous times, as, as a student life volunteer, as a peer mentor, where she guided three new GS students through the maze of Columbia. If that isn't enough, she volunteers as a reading partner and works individually with students to enhance their reading skills and foster a love of literature. Orly graduates with a degree in psychology, summa cum laude, a member of Phi Beta Kappa and the GS Honor Society. Next year, she will pursue a graduate degree at Teachers College. Congratulations, Orly. Our second alumni key awardee is Jan Kargulowicz. Jan and his family came to the US by way of Austria and Sweden as political refugees escaping the turmoil in Poland in the early 1980s. They eventually settled in Pennsylvania where other Polish refugees had put down roots. Jan attended a struggling high school after which, instead of attending college, he traveled and worked for several years in Iceland and Europe, and now speaks Icelandic. Jan returned to the US to help support his mother. After stabilizing the family's finances, he was able to focus again on his own education and secured a place in the honors program at Montgomery County Community College. Since his acceptance to GS, Jan has been a stellar student and fully engaged in the life of the community. He was a member of the parliamentary debate team and Phi Gamma Delta. He volunteered with Friends of Morningside Park and Columbia Community Outreach. Jan served as an orientation leader and student life volunteer. He worked with Columbia University facilities and volunteered to provide setup and security services at several sporting events. He is a writer and literary enthusiast and also spearheaded the creation of the first undergraduate journal of Islamic studies. Jan graduated this past February with a degree in sociology, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and a member of the GS Honor Society. Jan is currently an analyst for the Vanguard Group. Congratulations, Jan. Oh, the award would be nice. Voila. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Scott Halverson, and I am the Dean of Students here at the School of General Studies. President Bollinger, Provost Coatsworth, Executive Vice President Dirks, Dean Ahn, General Casey, Mr. Reardon, distinguished faculty, dedicated alumni, and assembled guests. It is my great pleasure to present to you our candidates 
for the Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science in the School of General Studies, class of 2012. Each degree candidate will be receiving a certificate of achievement from President Bollinger with this well-deserved moment captured on film by our photographers. Mr. George Hodge, class of 2007, will also present each graduate with a GS alumni pin. To the wonderful, supportive, and vocal family members and friends that have gathered today, we respectfully ask that you please hold your applause until all the graduates have been presented on stage. With a few exceptions, this year's class will be presented in reverse alphabetical order, approximately. Will the candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science please step forward? Amy Jennifer Worf, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology with a concentration in Educational Studies, magna cum laude. Angela Elizabeth Kellickner, Bachelor of Arts, English and Psychology. Jean A. Godden, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy. Johnny Eduardo Weber, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Catherine Wedding, Bachelor of Arts, History. Noah Scott Weingarten, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Adam Joseph Weiss, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. David Moshe Weltman, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, Double Concentration in Chemistry and Pre-Medical Sciences. Andrew Christopher Westbecker, Bachelor of Science, Earth Science with a Concentration in History. Edith White, Bachelor of Arts, Double Major African American Studies and Psychology. Brett Chasen Wolf, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies. Sarah Helen Woke, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Orly Ratsabi Cohen, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Summa Cum Laude. Jan Dominic Kargulovich, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology, Magna Cum Laude. Benjamin Bandel Wirtschafter, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Robert Scott Winterstein, Bachelor of Arts, African Studies with a concentration in Political Science. Michael Taylor, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology, Cum Laude. Tyler John Thompson, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing. Vanessa Torres Lautenbach, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Guy J. Tower, Bachelor of Science, Astrophysics. <laughs> Elfie Star Tuff, Bachelor of Arts, Religion. James Edmund Urbum, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing, Cum Laude. Joshua James Van Gundy, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, Cum Laude. Joshua Matea, Mateo Fassbinder, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Juliana Van Visco, Bachelor of Arts, Italian. Ladovica Vigliarde Paravia, Bachelor of Arts, French. 
Alexandra Vuka Vukcevic, Bachelor of Arts, double major English and Psychology. Skylar Dalton Volts, Bachelor of Arts, History, Cum Laude. Daniel Saul Walker, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Deborah Singleton, Bachelor of Arts, Art History. Jacqueline Tong, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development with a concentration in economics. <laughs> Stephanie Ann Bates, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Jonathan Lee Kruger, Bachelor of Arts, Double Major, Economics and Mathematics, Magna Cum Laude. Tatiana Tarintseva, Bachelor of Arts, Architecture, Cum Laude. Namiko Suzuki, Bachelor of Arts, Double Major, Philosophy and Sociology. Daniel Alexander Sucher, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies. Elizabeth Stefan, Bachelor of Arts, Art History, Visual Arts, with honors, summa cum laude. Adam Joseph Stein, Bachelor of Science, Biochemistry, magna cum laude. Martina Sarasova, Bachelor of Arts, Regional Studies. Daniel John Solomon, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Shannon Grant Smith, Bachelor of Arts, American Studies. Wojciech Shipchak, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Melissa Ashley Science, Bachelor of Arts, Women's and Gender Studies with Honors Magna Cum Laude. Kelly Lynn Singleton, Bachelor of Arts, African Studies with a Concentration in Human Rights. Chung Hyun Shin, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Michael Isaac Shapiro, Bachelor of Arts, History, Magna Cum Laude. Aiko Sadaguchi, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science with a Concentration in History and Theory of Architecture. Helen Joanna Shore, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. Carlo Cook Zhang Santelli, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Guts Filippi, Bachelor of Arts, <laughs> Classics with Honors. Eric Jonathan Shore, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies, Cum Laude. Harrison Isaac Schley, Bachelor of Arts, East Asian Studies. Mirala P. Sarza, Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience, and Behavior. Charlie Santos, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies. Grisalides Santos, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology. Monica Sani, Bachelor of Arts, History. Mark Richard Rupenstein, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Jessica Ann Rivera, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Karen Rios, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing and History with Honors. Kevin Michael Riley, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Melissa Lefkowitz, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Dong Ho Lee, Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience and Behavior, Cum Laude. Nicanor Mercado, Laudato Jr., Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology with Honors, Magna Cum Laude. Paris Alexandra Langley, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing. 
Rachel Limmer Lang, Bachelor of Arts, French with honors magna cum laude. Timothy J. Schultz, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies, magna cum laude. Aliza Catherine Minogue Natchison, Bachelor of Arts, Art History with honors, summa cum laude. Maxwell Arthur Bertolero, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy with Honors and Psychology with Honors, summa cum laude. Kyle Thomas Riggle, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy. Sarah Maradi, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, cum laude. Renee Moraida, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Miguel Angel Morel, Bachelor of Arts, English. Susan Mora Masato, Bachelor of Arts, English. Marie Elise Monnier, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Casey Yale Munishor, Bachelor of Arts, Art History. David Myers, Bachelor of Arts, History, Magna Cum Laude. Kiho Sungju Nam, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Gregory Ellis Newman, Bachelor of Arts, American Studies and History, Magna Cum Laude. Louis A. Parks, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Magna Cum Laude. Elizabeth Getchell Littlefield, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies. Miles Oliver Lennon, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Peter Lennox, Bachelor of Arts, Film Studies. Quing Lee, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, Magna Cum Laude. Jamik Jamar Lagan, Bachelor of Arts, History. Jason W. Lim, Bachelor of Arts, Biological Sciences. Chloe Esther Longstreet, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, with a concentration in Anthropology. Alexander Philip Ludlum, Bachelor of Arts, English, Cum Laude. Brian Joseph Mackis, Bachelor of Arts, History, with a concentration in Mathematics. Gadir Mahmood, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Olivia Mandelbaum, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology with Honors, Summa Cum Laude. Noriko Masumoto, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies, Cum Laude. Wilfred Harlan May, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology. Angela Marie Mayans, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology, Magna Cum Laude. Jason Chun Wu, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Stanislav Zevin, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Philosophy. Svetlana Zusina, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy with Honors, Summa Cum Laude. Jocelyn Francis Levenberg, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. David Joshua Ramirez, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing. Amanda Jean Raines, Bachelor of Arts, English, with a concentration in Human Rights. Yaara Pinhas, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology, Cum Laude. Oriane Nicole Piscula, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology. Colleen Marilyn Platt, Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience and Behavior, with honors, magna cum laude. Ali Steele Prodani, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics, with a concentration in Mathematics. Teresa Marie Rafferty, Bachelor of Arts, History. Anne Claire Varney, Bachelor of Arts, Economics with a concentration in Business Management, cum laude. Jennifer Wavereck, Bachelor of Arts, Art History, Visual Arts with Honors. 
Matodi Boykoff Lazarov, Bachelor of Arts, Economic Statistics. Natalia Krapiva, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, Summa Cum Laude. Mariam N. Kinklotz, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Lillian Rebecca Kwong, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies, with honors, Concentration in Sociology, Summa Cum Laude. Jason David La Ferreira, Bachelor of Arts, Computer Science, Mathematics. Karen Hojaev, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing with a concentration in Rus Russian Literature and Culture, Cum Laude. Darho Kim, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Elizabeth Suyun Kim, Bachelor of Arts, English, Concentration, Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies, Magna Cum Laude. Min Sion Kim, Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience and Behavior. Sung Hui Hong, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, Magna Cum Laude. Evangeline Jennifer Hoyer, Bachelor of Science, Evolutionary Biology of the Human Species. Lee Susanna Ifar, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Cum Laude. Benjamin Ilani, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern and South Asian and African Studies. Santana Marie Innes, Bachelor of Science, Evolutionary Biology of the Human Species. Tony Siobhan Johnson, Bachelor of Arts, African American Studies. Spencer Daniel Jones, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Anogi Joseph Arame, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Pooja Reddy Kadir, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, with a concentration in political science. Manaj Shaheen Kareem, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology, Magna Cum Laude. Tracy Kavanaugh, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Political Science. Laura Lee Joe Kelly, Bachelor of Arts, Visual Arts. Satya K. Khalsa, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing, Summa Cum Laude. Gerard Richard Miller, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Amanda Catherine Ann Cook, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Jason Alexander Gottlieb, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Aquia Graf, Bachelor of Arts, African American Studies with Honors. Leonard Greenfield, Bachelor of Arts, Classics. Rena Yoshevet Greenfield, Bachelor of Arts, Religion with Honors, Magna Cum Laude. Kelsey Robert Haskell, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Clara Hart, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Cum Laude. William Goh, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Matthew Yusim Haas, Bachelor of Arts, History, Magna Cum Laude. Isla Kalani, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Cum Laude. Ekaterina Bokii, Bachelor of Arts, Art History, Visual Arts. Benjamin Yarbrough Briggs, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Political Science. Lauren Daniel Berman, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Magna Cum Laude. Robin Joy Drabman, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Corey Simon Doliner, Bachelor of Arts, History. Audra Beth Duchenez, Bachelor of Science, Biochemistry. Emily L. Dinan, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology. Catherine Ann Elizabeth Dillard, Bachelor of Arts, History and Theory of Architecture. Ashley Nicole Griffith, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Cum Laude. 
Toriak Lamel de Chocho, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Brandon Wallace de Shields, Bachelor of Arts, African American Studies. Nancy Ruth de Groot, Bachelor of Arts, English Cum Laude. Maurice Emerson de Call, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing. <laughs> Raina de Beer, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. <laughs> Nancy Susan Davis, Bachelor of Arts, English. Jacqueline Michelle David, Bachelor of Arts, English Cum Laude. Charles Melvin Darling V, Bachelor of Arts, History. Heather Ann D'Angelo, Bachelor of Science, Environmental Biology. Vincent Nguyen, Bachelor of Science, Chemistry. Spencer Rose Oberman, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology, Cum Laude. Aaron Brianna O'Brien, Bachelor of Arts, English, Magna Cum Laude. Andrew Richard O'Connor, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, Cum Laude. Hannah Phelps Overlock, Bachelor of Arts, Art History. Allison O'Neill Patch, Bachelor of Arts, Religion, with a concentration in Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies, Magna Cum Laude. Jonah Alexander Paul, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, Cum Laude. Tatiana Pena, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, with a concentration in Business Management, management Magna Cum Laude. Rafael Roald Peterson, Bachelor of Arts, Music, Summa Cum Laude. Joanna Casey Granton, Bachelor of Arts, Architecture, Concentration in Art History, Magna Cum Laude. Gordon Morris Redmond II, Bachelor of Arts, American Studies, Cum Laude. Anna Fokina, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, Concentration in the Visual Arts, Magna Cum Laude. Caitlin Piper Flusser, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, Magna Cum Laude. Tobias Albert Fuchs, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy, with honors, summa cum laude. Charles Fletcher, Bachelor of Arts, Visual Arts. Michael Stephen McDonald, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Harley Glenn McGrew, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing with a concentration in Computer Science, magna cum laude. Rebecca Mang, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing. Benjamin Sean Mills, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, with honors, magna cum laude. Yara Micholi, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Women's and Gender Studies. <laughs> Olga Hayden, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Justin Aviram Hedbat. Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. <laughs> Silveri Herbert, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, Magna Cum Laude. Andrew Stewart Hill, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing and English, Magna Cum Laude. Shom Ashok Hinduja, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development. Amri Hodorov, Bachelor of Science, Double Major Computer Science and Economics, Cum Laude. Grant Radent Holton, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Lilia Muhammad Yarova, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Cum Laude. Jose Robledo, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science with a concentration in Economics. Ashley Iolani Duenas, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Visual Arts. Gergana Lakazarova Pancheva, Bachelor of Arts, Double Major Art History and Economics. 
David Gao, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, Magna Cum Laude. Da Quinn Gao, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Carla Faith Garcia, Bachelor of Science, Environmental Biology. Omer Geller, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Amy Ruha Gibbs, Bachelor of Arts, Film Studies, Cum Laude. Adrienne Lee Giffen, Bachelor of Arts, Theater Arts. Tricia Gill, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Zabina Anna Goldstein, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Danielle Marissa Golem, Bachelor of Arts, Double Major in Anthropology with Honors and Psychology, Summa Cum Laude. Luis Felipe Gonzalez Morgado, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Mathematics, Cum Laude. Devanan Durga, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Jonathan David Edelman, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing with a concentration in Psychology. Benjamin Lewis Ehrlich, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Magna Cum Laude. Alexander Anthony Estrin, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics, Magna Cum Laude. Charles Harley Evans, Bachelor of Arts, East Asian Studies. Axel Fogner, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Eldad Aitan, Bachelor of Arts, Film Studies. Ayala Elaiches, Bachelor of Arts, Biological Sciences. Kareem Ibrahim Al Sarafi, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies and Political Science. Leanne Fornelli, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, with honors, magna cum laude. Andrew Thomas Dunn, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science. Jayan Park, Bachelor of Arts, East Asian Studies and English. Yelena E. Ruhadze, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Laron Ryle Prosper, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Philosophy. Jessica Marie Fomen, Bachelor of Arts, Biological Sciences, Magna Cum Laude. Jessica Elizabeth Durdock, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology with Honors, Magna Cum Laude. Diana Armand, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Danielle Marie Bylan, Bachelor of Arts, English. Brooke Alaric Hill, Bachelor of Arts, Urban Studies, Magna Cum Laude. Isaiah Anthony Powell, Bachelor of Arts, Film Studies. Devin William Leung, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Zachary Lee Burnett, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics, Cum Laude. Dan He Cho, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development, Cum Laude. Yen Chun Ching, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, Cum Laude. Matthew Patrick Childress, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Yevgeny Chervonenko, Bachelor of Arts, Economics and Political Science. James Richardson Chavre, Bachelor of Science, Biochemistry. Lydia Chan, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Cum Laude. Joanna Diane Ketas, Bachelor of Arts, Mathematics, Summa Cum Laude. Timothy Lewis Cassidy, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Biashim Biashimov, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Jacob Joseph Kaplan, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics, Magna Cum Laude. Kyle Bukhari, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology. Caroline Farber, Bachelor of Arts, History. 
Darlene C. Feliciano, Bachelor of Arts, English, Cum Laude. Joshua Marcel Lane Faber, Bachelor of Arts, Mathematics with a concentration in Physics. Camilia Fuentes, Bachelor of Arts, Ethnicity and Race Studies with Honors, Magna Cum Laude. Surya Fakelman, Bachelor of Arts, Economics, Magna Cum Laude. Kenneth Cho, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Young Ho Cho, Bachelor of Arts, Mathematics Statistics. Jay Wung Choi, Bachelor of Arts, Biological Sciences. Brian Timothy Chanto, Bachelor of Arts, Sociology. Jin Young Chun, Bachelor of Arts, Mathematics Statistics. Jae Woo Chung, Bachelor of Arts, Financial Economics. Alexandra Foley Clayton, Bachelor of Arts, Theater Arts. Nathaniel Klinger, Bachelor of Science, Computer Science, Magna Cum Laude. Megan Elizabeth Cook, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology. Dana Alden Coppersmith, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science. Thomas Richardson Cox, Jr., Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience and Behavior. Jessica Lee Crenshaw, Bachelor of Arts, Art History, Cum Laude. Hava Ariel Creek, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Magna Cum Laude. Heather Dare, Bachelor of Arts, Art History. Elizabeth Meyer Bello, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy with Honors, Concentration in the Pre-Medical Sciences, Summa Cum Laude. Sandra Jillian Affleck, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science with a Concentration in Human Rights. Tali Anderman, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development with Honors, Concentration in Anthropology. Dina Lezebnik, Bachelor of Arts, English, Cum Laude. Elizabeth A. Lamarca, Bachelor of Science, Neuroscience and Behavior. Matthew G. Amadeo, Bachelor of Arts, Philosophy. Edwin Aponte, Bachelor of Arts, Creative Writing with a concentration in English. Aaron Scott Arbuckle, Bachelor of Arts, Anthropology, Cum Laude. Anatole Ashraf, Bachelor of Arts, English, with a concentration in Evolutionary Biology of the Human Species. Benjamin Barczewski, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, with a concentration in Philosophy, Magna Cum Laude. Kayron Giselle Abbasali, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development. Janice Allen, Bachelor of Arts, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. Carlos Barriento, Bachelor of Arts, Sustainable Development, with a concentration in Hispanic Studies. Simone Despina Bazos, Bachelor of Arts, American Studies with a concentration in African Studies. William Samuel Lisa, Bachelor of Arts, History, Cum Laude. Paul Anthony Darnell, Bachelor of Arts, Economics. Ibrahim okay. Dada Noor, Bachelor of Arts, African Studies. Azer Charles Baim, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, Magna Cum Laude. We have one more. Evan Hartley Platt, Bachelor of Arts, Political Science, with a concentration in Business Management.
Ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2012. We have mentioned many times this morning how the Columbia faculty are critical to the success of our students. There is no better example of this than our valedictorian, Maxwell Bertolero. Maxwell, who hails from the Bay Area, will tell you himself about his own challenging path to GS. But I want to add on Maxwell's behalf how grateful he is to one particular faculty member who has been an incredible mentor to him. When Professor Daphna Shohami of the Department of Psychology received the prestigious Lenfest Teaching Award this fall, she chose Maxwell to be the student who would speak about her as a teacher and mentor. Professor Shohame, he said, Help me see that thoughtful neuroscience research can tell us what it means to be human and make a genuine difference. She helped me develop the analytic skills required to do that type of neuroscience research and helped foster a confidence in my intellectual abilities that I lack. Maxwell completed his degree work requirements in December, and Professor Shohame offered him the opportunity to do research with her during the spring semester while he waited to hear back from PhD programs. He was very excited by the opportunity, but he writes, what brought tears to my eyes as I read her email in Avery Library is that she said, she wanted me to work with her because I think like a scientist. After spending my adolescence not being intellectually respected, to have someone not only praise my work, but also praise the way I think was overwhelming. This tribute to Professor Daphna Shohame could, I am sure, be repeated by many of you about your own faculty mentors. And I am sure that you will see the powerful result of this transformative engagement between student and mentor in our valedictorian and his words. Maxwell Bertolero is not only a brilliant scientist, but a passionate humanist, a man of integrity and compassion. I hope he said that one day I can do what Daphna did for me for someone else. Maxwell Bertolero graduates with a double major in honors in psychology and philosophy, higher than an A average, summa cum laude, phi beta kappa, and a member of the GS Honors Society. He is the only graduating senior in the country to be accepted to work towards his PhD in the research laboratory of the eminent cognitive neuroscience at the University of California, Berkeley, Professor Mark Desposito. It is a privilege for me to present to you the valedictorian of the class of 2012, Maxwell Bertolero. Uh, before, I wanna, before I start, I just want to thank Dean On for those kind words. Uh, everything he's done for me and for general studies as a program. Uh, if you've ever come into contact with him, even through an email, I'm sure you know that he's a lovely human being. So, round of applause for Dean On. <laughs> President Bollinger, Provost Coatsworth, Executive Vice President Dirks, General Casey, Dean On, families, friends, and fellow graduates. Think back to what you were doing nine years ago. 
give you a second. <laughs> so none of the memories we just conjured up forecast us graduating from Columbia today. Nine years ago, I was so depressed and anxious that I could barely function. And I had grown disgusted with high school, both socially and academically. I pleaded with my high school deans to let me take some time off, but they threatened that I'd be expelled if I was not at school the next day. And then I would never get into a good college. I would never get a good job. I would never be happy. I would be labeled hyperactive, undisciplined, over-emotional. The next day, I drove to school, but every time I reached for the door handle, I was paralyzed, just completely overcome with tears. I could not get out of my car. There was so much pressure to fit a mold, I just did not fit. And continuing to try to shove myself into that mold was hopeless. So I grabbed on to the only thing I enjoyed doing at the time, a sport called motocross, which is racing dirt bikes around tracks composed of hills, turns, jumps, and bumps. When I was floating 90 feet through the air with my heart a hummingbird, my anxiety and depression could not touch me. So while my friends finished high school, I moved to the Southern California desert, which is the epicenter of the sport in order to pursue a career racing dirt bikes. I spent five years of my life completely dedicated to making a living racing. I got beat a lot, I broke a lot of bones, but I learned that completely dedicating myself to something I am passionate about and letting it consume me makes me happy. But one can't race motocross forever. And despite my somewhat troubled academic history, I always had a passion for learning. So my mom suggested I take just one class. I started studying philosophy at Orange Coast Community College. I was terrified, but I applied what I had learned from racing to academics. I studied what I was passionate about and I let it consume me. And it worked. The next thing I knew, I was a Columbia student. And now I'm standing up here. All of our convoluted, complicated, and messy paths to this moment are far from recommended. Usually, if you don't, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Usually, if you don't fit the norm, if you deviate even once from the traditional path, it's expected that you won't be successful. You certainly won't end up here. But we made it here because GS knows that progress most often results from deviations from the norm. And the world needs more educated people who are not afraid to deviate from the norm. That's us. <laughs> As a result of this opportunity and our hard work, we are some of the most educated rule breakers in the world. <laughs> As Noam Chomsky says, opportunity confers responsibility. With our remarkable past and our amazing education comes an even greater responsibility. We came here not afraid to think differently. And we have to continue to think differently, to blaze new paths, and really embody the values that GS saw in us when they invited us here. But we also have to use the skill that is the defining value of our liberal arts education, the ability to control the way we think. We now have the ability to choose to think rationally and logically, even when it leads us to a result that seems grimmer than the result our intuitions deliver. As my symbolic logic professor, Akile Varzi, explained, Learning to use logic frees one's mind from being bound by one's limited intuitions. My struggles with mental disease, my studies of philosophy and the brain, 
and my newfound ability to use reason and logic instead of intuition have led me to some counterintuitive and unconventional insights concerning human freedom. We all intuitively feel as if we freely will our thoughts and our actions, and we judge others' actions as freely willed. However, this intuitive belief is flawed. Fighting depression, sorry. <laughs> Fighting depression taught me that there are limits to our freedom. I couldn't simply will more serotonin in my brain. I couldn't just decide to be happy and have it happen. But people judged me as if I could. My high school attributed my troubles to character flaws, not chemical imbalances. Had an organ other than my brain been affected, I certainly would have been given time off to recover. My philosophical and scientific studies here have taught me that I am not an entity that is separate from and controls the workings of my brain. I am what my brain does. During my depression, I wasn't freely controlling the storm of activity in my brain. I wasn't lost in that storm. I was the storm. As Einstein explains, human beings in their thinking, feeling, and acting are not free agents, but are as causally bound as the stars are in their motion. We are all forced screaming into this world with random genetics set upon a path we didn't even choose. And for every choice we make, we can, in theory, trace a causal chain back to one's genetics and the path one was placed on at conception. It's an illusion that a person, what we each call I, is a separate entity that can alter this causal chain independent of the chain itself. We can't be an uncaused cause of our behavior. We simply perceive our thoughts and our behavior as such when the causes of them are obscure to us. So I'm not claiming that we're not in control of our decisions, of the way in which we think or our actions. And I'm not saying that our lives are predetermined, that we are fated, and we can just sit back and the same events will occur no matter what effort we put in or the decisions we make. I didn't show up to Columbia and say, well, I have a personal history that interacts well with my genetics, so I can just sit back, relax, and watch the perfect grades flow in. Trust me, that's not how it happened. I had to try extremely hard. But while I put in that effort, my ability to do so, to be motivated, to not fall back into depression, were not things I earned on my own. Had I been born with different genetics to a different family, or even had different events occur in my life, I could have failed miserably. As Charles Darwin explains, this view should teach one profound humility. One deserves no credit for anything, nor ought one to blame others. This does not mean that sometimes I don't feel a little tiny bit self-important, given my accomplishments, or blame others for their actions. But I can choose to use reason and logic to override those flawed intuitions and emotions. Realizing that we are not completely free is scary, but as Bertrand Russell says, even though the open windows of science make us shiver after the comfortable indoor warmth of traditional humanizing myths, that fresh air brings vigor, and the great spaces of science have a grandeur all their own. The scientific view of human freedom leads us down a more pragmatic and empathetic path than does the myth of free will, as it views the brain as another organ that can break, but also that can be fixed, and promotes empathy, not blame, towards the person who is suffering. I have let neuroscience and philosophy consume me, and now I perceive everything, including human freedom, differently than I did before. I have loved this process, and I hope that my career as a scientist 
allows me to constantly see things differently than I did the day before, both inside and outside of the lab, and that I can discuss what I see with others in hopes of making the world a tiny bit better. To me, that is a source of happiness that feeds off itself, growing stronger every single day. This has been my development as a person. While your development was certainly different in content and conclusions, it was not different in methodology and opportunity. And we all share the same responsibility. We all have a logical, free, and fearless intellect, combined with a unique perspective given our past. From this opportunity flows the responsibility not to waste it to use it to make the world a tiny bit better. It is unimaginably hard to do this, to stay actively conscious and logical, really thinking day in and day out, and to have the resulting insights motivate one's actions, especially when those actions are risky deviations from the norm. But if anyone can do this, we can. So we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be us, without the people who supported and nurtured us, as well as the people who tried to pull us down, but actually catapulted us to success. So I'm going to go thank my high school for kicking me out. And then thank my friends, family, and professors while we throw back a lot of whiskey. I encourage you to handle yourself in similar ways. <laughs> Celebrate who you are and what you have done, but do it with some of the people who are responsible for your being who you are and accomplishing what you have done. Congratulations and good luck out there. Nicely done, Max. Congratulations to the graduates, your families, loved ones, and friends. You embody in a unique and compelling way the mission and vision of GS and Columbia. I hope you will stay involved with your Columbia family for many years to come. I invite you all to continue the celebration at the class day reception to be held under the tents on Avery Plaza. As you exit to the right, there will be student marshals to guide you. Since we're all headed in the same direction, I'd ask that our guests remain seated and allow the president's party to exit first. Then our graduates will exit, followed by families and friends. Thank you. Will the candidates please stand? Thank you very much, Lee. Really, that was wonderful. Uh, we're going to go back that way.